Happy Father's Day. <clears throat> we, are, uh, we are currently in a sermon series through the book of Exodus. And uh, at the beginning, I said uh, to you that uh, we have planned, we have laid it before the Lord, right? So we planned that this would be a 10-part series. Um, but I said to you, remember, I said to you, uh, if we were to look back at uh, the, the series that we did through the book of Mark, it went on a little bit longer than we thought, right? Because God was doing some work. Um, and so I said, hey, I, 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 it's 10 parts, but who knows? Uh, well, today I'm here to tell you that uh, it is now an 11-part series. Um, and that's uh, because uh, while we were navigating through the text last week, I, I noticed uh, some words that were used by God to Moses, for Moses to say to Pharaoh. And, and I passed through uh, those words fairly quickly because uh, that was not the point of the sermon last week. Uh, but in preparation for this week, where we were supposed to cover the Passover this week, I, I just kept going, you know what, we, we need to go back to uh, what God said to Moses because it's significant. In fact, it's, it's one of the themes that we will uh, find in the book of Exodus. I also believe that it's one of the themes that we will find in the scriptures. And so it's necessary for us to at least unpack it by way of introduction. I'm not going to be able to do everything, but by way of introduction to unpack it so that you might be able to go home and begin to study it for yourself. Why? So that you might live from it. Because it'll change everything. And so this morning, I would like to talk to you about the theology of sonship. The theology of sonship. Now, in last week's sermon, you would have heard me read Exodus 4.21-22, to 22, where it says, The Lord instructed Moses, when you go back to Egypt, make sure you do before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put within your power. But I will harden his heart so that he won't let the people go. And you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go. Look, I'm about to kill your firstborn son. Now, right out the gates in Exodus, there's quite a, a lot of talk about sons. If you would remember, Pharaoh had instructed first the midwives, then uh, all the people of Egypt to kill the firstborn sons of the Hebrews, right? So there's quite a lot of talk of sons. And, and here uh, we see God saying, Israel is my firstborn son. God makes an interesting statement by referring to Israel as his firstborn son. If you're familiar with the Christian faith and the Bible, you'd probably be thinking right now, I thought Jesus God was your son, which is correct. It's correct. So now it leaves us with the question of, of what, is, what does this mean? And, 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 and what are the implications of this? What does this mean and what are the implications of this? Well, as always, let's go to Scripture. Because here at Rooted Fellowship, we believe that Scripture interprets Scripture. And this helps us understand who God is and what that means for our lives. Now, let me point our attention to the book of Hosea. Remember, trying to, trying to develop within you a theology of sonship. Let me point you to the book of Hosea, which is a great book. I encourage you to go read it. I want us to go there quickly because we will see the comment of Israel being God's son and then Hosea connecting to Exodus. Ho Hosea Chapter 11, verse 1. It says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. We see Hosea going, going back to Exodus here. See, we're given a glimpse into the larger story of the coming of Jesus, of which the story of Hosea is a part of. Remember, all of Scripture points to Jesus. We covered this in the first part of Exodus. All of Scripture points to Jesus. And then Jesus points us to the Father. Now, we know this to be true in Hosea, that this is pointing to the coming of Jesus, because Matthew writes in his gospel account of Jesus, in chapter 2, verse 15, that when Jesus was carried by his parents to Egypt for his safety as an infant, his subsequent, his subsequent return out of Egypt fulfills Hosea 11, 
verse 1. Let's read it together. And, and let's start from verse 13 to give some context. After they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. Real quick, I just want to uh, show you some similarities. Well, maybe just show you one. Some uh, similarity between Moses and Jesus here. Herod is, is, is seeking to kill uh, this boy. He's looking for this boy, this Messiah that's been prophesied about. So he wants to kill him. Well, if you go back to Exodus, what was Pharaoh doing? He was killing his firstborn sons. Verse 14. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death. So what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, which one, Hosea, might be fulfilled, out of Egypt I called my son. God is always at work. He has a plan. And here we're seeing him put it in motion through the theme of sonship. Scripture interprets Scripture. And it points us, as always, to Jesus, who points us to the Father. Hence, we always plead for the Holy Spirit to guide us continually as we come to the Bible. Because only then will we see how the Bible, in reality, is one beautiful story. Multiple authors, multiple contexts, but one beautiful story. So Matthew here interprets Hosea in the same way that Hosea interprets Exodus. You see, in Hosea... The way he puts it, the prophet, Israel is going back to Egypt in judgment, which symbolizes the, the, the looming captivity in Assyria. But it's also kind of pointing us to a future day of restoration, the coming of a new exodus. As Matthew looks back at the exodus through Hosea, he says that the new exodus has come through the coming of Jesus. Matthew goes, guys, I want you to see something. I'm pointing you back to Hosea, who points us back to Exodus, but he's like, guys, I, I, I think the new Exodus is here. I think it's here. Something is happening. But what is this sonship? Right? Having said that, what is this sonship and why is it important? And so today I'd like to offer us a theology of sonship and try to show you why it's important, to show you its implications. So to do that, let's take a look at some of, some sons in the Bible, right? Not all of them. We don't have time. Uh, but let's look at a few sons in the Bible. Let's start uh, at the beginning, right at the beginning. Let's start with Adam. Adam, who is God's son through physical creation, right? So Adam is God's son through physical creation. We see this in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28. Seven, let me uh, remind many of you. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. And he created them male and female. Right out the gates, we see God creating his first son through physical creation. And so it's for this reason Luke is able to call Adam the Son of God, in his uh, genealogy of Jesus that we find in Luke chapter 3. Likewise, all human beings share in this image of God and can be called the sons of God in the sense. See, there is a truth in the universal fatherhood of God here. That's what we see. That's what we pick up, a universal fatherhood of God. This is to say that God is the father of all people through creation. God is the father of of all people through creation, but hear me, that alone will not get you to heaven. I want to be clear about that. It will not get you to heaven. You must become the sons of God through the new birth in order to go to heaven. I'll talk about that in a moment. Now, let me stop here real quick before we get too far ahead and ask the question that maybe some of you are asking in the room. What about being a daughter of God? Oh, no, we hear you that you're going to create a theology here of sonship. Uh, and we, we're picking up already on, on quite a few sons here. Um, but what about the daughter of God? Uh, the sisters in the room you're going, well, what about us? How do we then fit into all of this? Well, I would say, uh, stay with me. 
Stay with me. I will uh, a little later show you that this language here is not just contextual. See, a lot of people would say that. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural thing, and then they would want uh, us to kind of just say, hey, just, just include daughters here. But no, hold on. It's not just cultural. It's also biblical. Something biblical is happening here. And because it's biblical, it'll also be beneficial in such a beautiful way for all the women in this room. And so just stay with me. Don't check out. All right, so let's go back here. Uh, the fact that all of mankind can be considered the sons of God gives the Apostle Paul common ground when he says in his sermon to the Greek f- philosophers uh, at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, it gives him common ground to say this, for in him, this is Acts 17, 28 to 29, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are all his offspring. Since then, we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. He's he's pointing everyone to to God in a sense saying, listen, uh, because of Adam, God's first son by physical creation, therefore all of us in, in, in a way can look to God as our father. Paul, in another place, in Corinthians, tells us that mankind bears the image of Adam who carried the image of God. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of heaven, the man of heaven, Paul writes. And I believe, for this reason, James appeals to the image of God that remains in a sinful state when he talks about the power of the tongue in James chapter 3. It says from verse 8, James 3, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord the Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. There it is again. From Adam, God's son through physical creation, we're able to see this this sonship. God's son through physical creation is Adam. But let me take you to another son, the nation of Israel. All right, so God's son through national election. There is another sense in which scripture speaks of this idea of sonship, and uh, we see it in Exodus chapter 4, where God sends Moses back to Egypt. I read it in the introduction. And he says, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Because God wanted to take them to the land of promise, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This will never get old, and I'll keep saying it. I just love it. He wants to take them to this place, a good and spacious land, land flowing with milk and honey. And so God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh in verses 22 and 23, and you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. This is what Hosea had in mind in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, when he said, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. He's pointing to the nation of Israel as his son. Now, Israel is not the only people group spoken of as God's son. In Numbers chapter 3, we see God accepting the Levites as substitutes for the firstborn sons as he sets them apart for service, for the service of priesthood. Numbers 3, from verses 11 to 13, says, And the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have chosen the Levites from among the Israelites to serve as substitutes for all the firstborn sons of the people of Israel. The Levites belong to me. For all the firstborn males are mine. We'll come back to that in the later chapters of Exodus and unpack what that actually means. So not only is the nation of Israel corporately spoken of as God's sons or the Levites, but King David himself is promised that he would have a descendant who would be called son by God. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. It says, For when you die... And are buried with your ancestors. I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring. And I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name. And I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father 
and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod, like any father would do. These verses are dripping with so much prophecy. And how I wish I had time to unpack it. It's, it's absolutely beautiful how, how in many ways it points to Jesus. And yet it elevates Jesus as the promised Messiah. Because here he says, listen, I'm going to correct and discipline him with the rod. Jesus never needed that. He never needed that. But still he took on the discipline that was meant for us. Dripping with so much prophecy. In Isaiah, the prophet raises the stakes by saying that this son will be virgin-born and called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. You see this in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A few chapters further, Isaiah unpacks more about the son. Uh, in a passage that many of us know, we, it's preached out of uh, around Christmas time. So Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. You get a little bit more into who this son is. And we see here that so much is given to the son, given to him by his father. He is given a name. He's given authority. He's given a space to rule. And he's given prosperity. Friends, the list goes on and on and on. But, but let's go to Jesus, right? Because we know that this is speaking of Jesus. And so let's just go directly to him, who is also a son. Jesus is God's son through eternal generation. He's God's son through eternal generation. You see, Jesus is qualified to be called the son of God by virtue of the divine and the beauty of his birth. Let me explain. You see, the genealogies of Matthew and Luke serve to show that Jesus is the son of David, Abraham, and Adam. Right? It's, it's not just names there, because um, sometimes we'll read and we'll go, why are they here? Why are they here? But they serve a purpose. I believe they, they're helping us understand this theme of sonship and how it connects us back to the Father. We see that Jesus is the son of David, Abraham, and Adam. He is the descendant of Adam and therefore the son of God by firstborn, by physical creation. He's the descendant of Abraham and therefore the son of God through national election as the true seed of Abraham. He's the descendant of David and therefore heir to the throne of Israel and the title promised to David's seed as son. It matters. It's important. And so with this truth, I believe that Matthew 2.15, where Matthew points us back to Hosea, where we have just read, out of Egypt I called my son. In, in many ways, I believe what, what, what Matthew is doing here is connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament. And he's doing that through sonship. Let me also point out to us some parallels of Jesus' life in Matthew from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 7, right? Uh, with Israel's experience in Exodus. Let me, let me show you some similarities here, right? We see in both cases a wicked ruler. You've got Herod, you've got Pharaoh. We see murdered infants. We see sojourn in Egypt. We see departure from Egypt. We see a passing through the Red Sea that we can connect to baptism in the Jordan River. We see temptation in the wilderness. We see the old covenant given at Mount Sinai and the new covenant given in the Sermon on the Mount. But where Israel failed to obey 
the commands of the old covenant, Jesus succeeded and then ushered in the new covenant. Where, where one son failed, the other succeeded. D.A. Carson, an old man, but a very wise man, says this. In fact, Jesus is often presented in the New Testament as the antitype of Israel. That is, the true and perfect Israel who does not fail. If Israel is likened to a vine that produces disgusting fruit, we see this in Isaiah chapter 5, Jesus is the true vine who brings forth good fruit, John 15. If Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years and was frequently disobedient in the course of many trials and temptations, Jesus was sorely tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, but was perfectly obedient. Jesus himself is the son of Israel, indeed a son of David, was supremely the son of God, and therefore he reenacted and summarized something of history of the son whose very existence pointed forward to him. Jesus is both the ideal, the perfect Adam, and the perfect Israel. He is the perfect son. He is the people of God, the seed of Abraham, to whom all promises were made. Jesus, as the son of Adam, accomplishes that which Adam failed to do. That is why we are where we are. We live in a broken, chaotic, sinful world because the first son, through physical creation, failed. And Jesus did not. But there is so much more to Jesus' sonship than merely physical, being a physical descendant from Adam, Abraham, and David. Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of God, to borrow words from the New King James Version. He's the eternal second person of the Trinity. He, he did not become the Son of God at Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. No. He, he has been the Son of God throughout all eternity. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, there was never a time when the Son was not. And I think for, for us, it can be difficult to comprehend all of this. Because of our human experience, it can be quite, quite challenging. Because for us, human fathers always precede their sons in time. But the Heavenly Father has an eternally begotten Son. And the scripture is clear on this. We see this in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has not been created. This is speaking of Jesus. He's always been there. Always, eternally, the begotten son. Also, we can look at the I am statements that are made in the Gospel of John. Where Jesus here himself, he's declaring it himself. He's talking about his eternal state of being. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. This is the contrast between the Son of God and all humans. He's making it abundantly clear. Humans were, but Jesus is and has always been. Which, friends, brings us to us. Right? What about us then? Like, like, if I'm a Christian, if you are a Christian here today, what, what does all of this mean? How, how is this significant to me? Well, as believers, we are God's sons through spiritual rebirth. As believers, we are God's sons through spiritual rebirth. The, the wonder of wonders is that we, the fallen sons of Adam, can be the sons of God. That's one of the beauties of the gospel. Not in the same way as Jesus being the second person of the Trinity, but we are in a relationship through Jesus with the Father. And when that happens, we become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Paul says to the church in Galatia, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Here's what he says. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. I love this word, all. Whether in Hebrew or Greek, it means the same thing. It means all. Right? So all. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I've heard so many people use this verse out of context. They use it to go, hey, here's why there's no distinct function between male and female, because of this passage. No, that's incorrect. You're reading it out of context. On how do you know that? Well, it's because here he's talking about sonship. He's pointing us to sonship. He starts in verse 26 by saying, for you are all sons of God through faith. And then at the end, he says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise of what? The promise of sonship. And here, I believe, is where the magic lies, where the beauty of sonship now begins to be on display. Here's where I now call upon our ladies. Remember, I said, stay with me. But now, here we are. Here, ladies, is where sonship matters for you in the same way it matters for men. But let me be clear. Let's go back to Exodus 4. God says to to Moses, and you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Firstborn. Firstborn son. You'll notice that God is intentional with his words here. God refers to Israel as his firstborn son. Adam was the first son through physical creation. Jesus is referred to as the firstborn of all creation and the firstborn from the dead. This phrase firstborn is scattered throughout the Bible. And there's a lot to talk of firstborn sons because there's a lot of weight that is placed on firstborn sons. What do you mean, Oni? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. You see, culturally, back then, the firstborn son communicated so much. Uh, We're told that firstborn sons would uh, get not just an inheritance, but double, a double portion of it. And this wasn't because uh, the father was like, well, it's because I love my firstborn son and I don't care about the other kids. No, 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 no. In doing so, it was a way of communicating that as a father, there is more to come. I'm able to give my firstborn son a double portion because there is more to come. The the weight that is placed on the firstborn son is is that he is to to take this, this responsibility. First, he takes the name and ensuring that the legacy from the father will continue, but then he also takes the inheritance and he says, you know what? I am going to do something with it. I am going to multiply it. I'm going to make sure that this continues to grow and grow and grow. The weightiness of it. Let me give you a little bit more cultural nuance here. Back then, uh, when the firstborn son came, it communicated to the family that the womb was now open. I know it's a little strange, but that's what they believed. And what that communicated was, okay, because the womb is now open, that means there is more children to come. It is the promise of more. Now, maybe firstborn sons might be something that we're struggling with even now. And I understand, I understand. So let me take you to uh, the first fruits. The Bible speaks of first fruits, that, that we are to consecrate, conse- consecrate, there we go, uh, first fruits to God, that we are to, to, in a sense, bring our first fruits to Him. Why do we do that? It's because we're believing that there's more to come. I give my first fruits to God and I'm like, you know, I can trust God because I know there's more to come. First born matters. It matters. Maybe I could take you to Abraham and Isaac real quick. Real quick. A promise is made to Abraham. They wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they do some disobedient stuff, and they wait, and they wait, and then Isaac shows up. Because God said, I'm going to, through you, through this son that I'm going to give you, there's going to be a massive blessing. The nations will come from you. And then he says to him, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. Now, Abraham's probably going, no, hold on. Uh, yes, 100%, I don't want to sacrifice my son like that, that, come on. But what about the promise? And they go up the mountain. 
I fast forward to the end. He's about to sacrifice his son, and then God says, stop. There's a ram there. Sacrifice that. I see that you have been obedient. You have trusted me by saying, okay, I'll sacrifice my son because because there's more to come. I don't know how it's going to come, but there is more to come. God will fulfill what he has promised. Here's another way to say it. God provides what he requires. And in many ways, he does that through his firstborn son. Now, look, let's be honest. I know folks in the room are going, oh, no. Isaac wasn't Abraham's firstborn son. I've read my Bible. And that's good. It's good that you picked that up, right? So Ishmael was the firstborn son. But but let me show you a pattern here in the Bible. It's beautiful. Ishmael was the firstborn son, but he was rejected. And then it was Isaac who received the blessing. Let's go to another son. Esau, firstborn son, but he was rejected. Remember, he sold his birthright. And so Jacob received the blessing, and so on, and so on, and so on. Reuben was rejected, and so Joseph received the blessing. Manasseh was rejected, and then Ephraim received the blessing. Adam was rejected, and all that come from him. We've all been rejected. Now, now this is a, a, it's a difficult thing to, to understand, to comprehend, to sit in. But Adam was rejected and all that come from him because of sin. And so then Jesus was received. And he received the blessing and all that come from him. Jesus is the firstborn of the ultimate promise. Like the firstborn son from the womb, promising more to come, Jesus is the firstborn from the tomb with the promise of more to come. Sonship matters. And so in the book of Hebrews, Christ is heir of all things and God's firstborn into the world. Just as the firstborn son is head over his earthly family after his father, Jesus Christ is head of the body of Christ, the church, after God the Father. Just as the firstborn son receives the greatest inheritance from his father, Jesus Christ receives the world as his inheritance. Psalm 2 verse 8, Only ask, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. Jesus receives the double portion. He receives the double portion as the firstborn son. But what does that mean for us? What does it mean for those who surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior? Well, the beauty of Jesus is he receives it and he continues with what has always been commanded for firstborn sons. He then goes, I'm turning to the rest of you and I'm inviting you to share in all of this. That you can look to Jesus as the promise being fulfilled and so therefore we can trust that our Father cares for us. But if you don't believe me, let's, let's read some scripture. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, it says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, what? Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. What does that mean? Stop living as a slave. Because you have received the adoption of sonship. And that comes with so much. This passage speaks of intimacy and freedom. The intimacy that we have with God the Father and the freedom that we are given Let's read Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. It says, For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. 
Here we pick up on the theme of adoption again, but then here we see glorification. That in the same way the Son has, is glorified, we too will receive that glorification. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, it says, See what great love the Father. The Father. You cannot disconnect sonship from the Father. Sonship is made possible because of the Father. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. And then lastly, let me read John 1, verses 12 to 13. It says, But to all who did receive Him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Uh, a friend of mine uh, unpacked this passage quite beautifully in a way that I'd never seen before. He says, do you know what this says about all, all of us who in some shape or form, uh, our story comes from uh, abuse. It comes from something that was tragic, that happened, uh, 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 that, that we come from a, a situation, dare I say it, of rape. Like, like, what does it say here? It says, well, for all those who did receive Christ, I want you to know that you were not born of natural descent or the will of the flesh or the will of man. Yes, biologically that's what happened, but, but you've always been on the Father's heart long before your parents even thought of doing what it is that they wanted to do. It speaks of restoration. And so what we are seeing here is that through his death and resurrection, Jesus is the first fruit who guarantees the future resurrection and eternal life of many other sons and daughters of God. Sonship gives us so much. This is why I felt it necessary to, to in a way, pause uh, and then add on. Uh, we'll figure it out. But I found it necessary for us to say, listen, we need to unpack this theme of sonship. Because I believe if we understand what that means for us, it will change how we, we navigate and engage in this world. So many of us will go, yeah, I'm a Christian, but we still have a slave mentality. Largely because maybe we, we don't understand what an inheritance means here from an earthly perspective. M maybe we don't understand what it means to be taken care of. Maybe we don't understand uh, that, that, no, 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 you, you, you have been provided for. We don't get that. And so we, we work and we grind and we hustle. Sonship gives us so much. Just like Jesus, it gives us a name. Just like Jesus, it gives us authority. Just like Jesus, it gives us a space to rule. Just like Jesus, it gives us prosperity. It gives us hope. It gives us restoration. It gives us freedom. I could go on and on and on. This is the gift of sonship that is given to all those who would surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. An heir of God, co-heirs with Christ. And who lavishes all of this on us? God the Father. God the Father. And so today on Father's Day, I, I, while I want to celebrate and, and honor uh, the earthly fathers here who are striving to do good work, I also want to point us to our heavenly Father who's already done the work. He sent His firstborn after generation to generation the generation of trying with us, going, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me try with this family. Here's a father, here's a son. Oh, it doesn't work. Disobedience. Okay, let me try with this one. Oh, he squandered everything. Okay, let me try. I'm trying to give a picture to the world of, of what a father-son relationship looks like. He then goes, you know what? It's okay. I'll show you myself. I'll send my own son. Stop the working. Stop the hustling. Stop the grinding. Rest in Him. It's God the Father who lavishes all of this on us. 
And we see this and we experience this through the theme and the theology of sonship. This is why it's important. As we continue through the book of Exodus and, and as we jump into the next part where we talk about the Passover, you're going to see God saying, I want you to consecrate, I want you to set apart the firstborn males. Now we'll have an understanding of why that is. It points us to this beautiful relationship that exists between God the Father and God the Son. And it makes it possible for us to enter into that relationship and to call God our Heavenly Father. So let me close with these words and ask the band to come up and lead us in a closing song. These are words by an old man. He's now dead. He's with Jesus. But he was a faithful man. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Here's what he says. He says, the Christian gospel does not start with the Lord Jesus Christ. I read that and I was like, hold on, Martin. Sounds a little heretical there. But as I've been taught, always read the text in context. So I kept reading. He says, the Christian gospel does not start with the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts with God the Father. In the beginning. The Bible starts with God the Father always, everywhere, and we must do the same. Because that is the order in the blessed trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, for many of us, let that be maybe a new way of seeing and entering the beauty of the gospel. It doesn't take away the power of the gospel, but it helps us see that this has been the plan of God the Father from the very beginning. To send His Son to come and live the life that we are all called to live but could not, and then to die the death that we all deserved. He took on our disobedience. He took on our sin our imperfections. And then rose from the dead. As the scriptures say, Jesus, you are the firstborn from the dead. That from the tomb, you lead a generation of men and women who put their faith in you. You, you, you lead us to the Father's heart. Right now, Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. But you have not left us on our own to try to figure out how to navigate through life. You have sent us, God, the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us, who fills us, who reminds us, who counsels us. And in all of it, points us to Jesus who then points us to you Father and so on this day as we celebrate Father's Day Father help us to glorify you as our Heavenly Father would you meet us all where we are would you fill the gaps of brokenness here this morning where earthly fathers have failed God, our Heavenly Father, would you fill through your Son? Where earthly fathers have left chaos and a mess, Heavenly Father, would you bring restoration and begin to piece together? Would you remind us of our identity in Christ, recognizing all that we have received because of your first and begotten Son, the Son of promise, fulfilled, accomplished in victory. Help us, Father. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.